I'd like to let you into a secret that um, I would have been much more disappointed um, or upset or stressed today if I hadn't recently rediscovered a wonderful prayer. Uh, a few, few weeks ago, um, I was running a, a retreat and we'd planned in the afternoon on this retreat, it was January in Scotland, that whatever the weather, we were gonna go outside on a kind of mini pilgrimage. And I'd emailed people ahead of time and put in capital letters, we will be going outside whatever the weather, um, please bring suitable clothing. Now, I was one of only two people who forgot their waterproof clothing. And uh, on the day, the weather was awful. Uh, even by January in Scotland standards, it was absolutely tipping it down. Uh, water was running down the, the street outside the building we were meeting in. But true to our word, at two o'clock, he said, no, we're going to go outside. And a friend of mine who was... Um, helping me on that day, gave some instructions for this little pilgrimage we were going to do. And he said, what I want you to do is uh, get into pairs, step outside the door, and you pray together this simple prayer. For what we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. <laughs> and, uh, and people did that. They, got all the waterproofs on steps outside the door and and a couple of hours later people came back in absolutely buzzing with uh, what they'd experienced um out there uh, including myself i was soaked to the skin but uh, it'd been a wonderful experience and since then i've been finding that simple prayer really helpful um i think it was the first prayer i ever heard i remember the head teacher at the little primary school where I went, um, if you stayed for school dinners, he would he would pray that prayer. And it seems so simple. You know, is it even a prayer? And yet, if you think about it, it's got uh, expectation. So, you know, when, as soon as you say those words for what we are about to receive, suddenly things don't just happen to us. We We receive things. And it speaks of gratitude, which is, you know, really important, isn't it? When you think of all the teaching about prayer in the New Testament, you know, pray with thanksgiving is such an important part of that. And, and it's centered on the Lord. So I think those three things, you know, expectation, gratitude, centered on the Lord, makes it actually a really powerful prayer. So, so this morning when I woke up and I felt really grim, um, I've, oh, I can't remember having such a sore throat ever before in a high temperature. And I started to think, ooh, what if, if I can't do these talks for, the, for this group coming today? That would be terrible, you know. And uh, I shared this thought with my wife. But then I just said that prayer, and we've said it many, many times over the last month. So I said, well, you know, for what we're about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. And it, it is, uh, it's a transformative thing. And I wonder if we might say that prayer together ourselves now for, for this whole experience, the time away here. Let's say that prayer together for what we are about to receive. May the Lord make us truly thankful. Amen. So um, I should introduce myself a bit. Um, I am uh, married to Liz. She's she's here. She's around these days. Uh, we have two sons. They're they're in their twenties now, away from home. One in Edinburgh, one in Wales. And we live in the north of Scotland. Uh, I'll, I'm actually going to show you a picture of where we live in a little while. And I work for the Church of Scotland as a mission development worker. I always think I, I could slice up my life into three sections, really. The first section, they're a fairly equal size. You know, the first couple of decades, I, I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't even interested in, in such things. 
Um, the second decade, I was uh, a Christian and lived most of it in South Asia, in, in Nepal. And then uh, these last years, we've been uh, back in the UK and living in the Highlands. Um, during my work with the Church of Scotland, I've been involved in quite a bit of research, particularly work amongst people who are Christians, but not, not engaged with, um, with local congregational church. Um, and I wrote a book about that called The Invisible Church, trying to understand the changing shape of the church. And as I'll explain in, in one of the sessions uh, these days, um, that book kind of led me into this idea of rewilding the church that we're going to be explaining a bit. Um, I always feel at the start of a retreat that I, I want to say, well done, to the people who come. Because, um, you know, we all know it's really important to get away. Uh, we want to follow Jesus, model our lives on on his, and we know that that he was in the habit of of, of getting away as far as he was able. And, and he found that very difficult. You know, he tried to get away and the crowds would follow him. So... I, I, I always want to say well done, because not only did you, you put this in your diary, you decided to come here, but you've kind of fended off all other competition and got yourself along to, to Lee Abbey for these days. So uh, the Proclaimers sing a song. Uh, I would walk 500 miles. Uh, well, we haven't walked it, but uh, Liz and I travelled down from somewhere in ex excess of 500 miles north of here. I think we're about nearly 600 miles north of here. Um, we live in a small village called King Craig in the Highlands. And you know, these days together, we're going to be thinking about rewilding. That's about letting nature take care of itself and, and letting the natural rhythms and processes within ecosystems to to create wilder more diverse habitats it, it's a way of restoring degraded landscapes and in our reflections we will especially of course be thinking about how that concept and the principles within it might be a helpful metaphor for what god is doing in the church these days and, and therefore, because we are the church, um, the adventure into which he invites us to, to join in. And this place where, where we live, um, I think you're, you're seeing a picture of that now, is that correct? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, this, this particular place um, where we live really kind of, highlights uh, some things um, because although um, the power and processes at the heart of nature, what, what biologists call the biotic potential in all living things is something we, we can't create or ultimately control, um, the decisions we make shape the resulting landscapes and the ecosystems within them. And this picture kind of illustrates it because the river in the middle of the picture here is, is the Spey. And at this point in its course, it divides two huge bits of land that are owned by people with two very different ideas about how to steward or, or manage the land. On one side is the Cairngorms. Uh, and several landowners there have entered into a 200-year partnership to rewild the landscape. They're, they're going to let that, that biotic potential of the organisms within that area to, to have its way and create the kind of landscape that results from that. And even just now, a few years into that project, we can already see the changes. We see young woodlands springing up on hillsides that were previously barren, um, peatlands showing signs of recovery, and, and rivers 
moving more freely across their floodplains. The hills on the opposite side of the Spey are traditional sporting estates, so they're managed for uh, grouse shooting and, and for deer stalking. And as time goes on, the ecosystems of either side of the valley are becoming increasingly different. Now, natural processes are at work in both cases, but on one side of the valley, they are released, encouraged, nature itself is in charge. On the other side, nature is constrained, managed, kind of fashioned by human interventions. To illustrate the fundamental difference between two ways of viewing landscape and, and what it might have to say about the church, and to give you a little flavor of the, um, the contentious and provocative nature of rewilding, both, both in the natural world and as a metaphor for what God might be showing to the church, I'm gonna just read a couple of pages from the book rewilding the church and i wouldn't normally do this but it, it happens to take as its illustration somewhere in this part of the world cornwall has some of the most sublime scenery in the uk now i was expecting to hear a little cheer at that point from some people there the mountains and glaciers of the Alps comprise some of the most exquisite jewels in the environmental crowns of France, Austria, Italy, and Switzerland. However, the euthymistically named Cornish Alps tell a tragic tale of carelessness for nature and stand as a stark reminder of mankind's willingness to sacrifice ecosystems for profit. Scattered around the old market town of St. Austell on what was previously granite moorland, <clears throat> the extraction of kaolin or china clay for the production of porcelain and paper has left a bleak, ravaged landscape. For every tonne of china clay removed, approximately nine tonnes of mineral waste has been extracted, creating a moonscape of deep lesions in the land. It's here, in the midst of this environmental catastrophe, this egg box-like scenery of peaks and pits and lagoons of clay slurry, that Dutch-born British businessman Tim Smith conceived the idea of constructing the remarkable environmental education venture known as the Eden Project. Visitors who enter this one-time industrial wasteland are confronted by two gigantic domes, each constructed of hundreds of hexagonal plastic cells supported by miles of intricate metal framework. The larger dome, 55 meters tall, simulates a tropical rainforest environment. The second, slightly smaller, but still enormous dome, replicates a Mediterranean environment. In the middle of the former, were it not for the wheelchair-friendly pathway, it would be easy to imagine oneself in a remote corner of Costa Rica or Borneo. I, for one, was grateful to make use of the refrigerated cool room before continuing to revel in this incredible replica of a tropical biome. But it is a replica. Although the Eden Project used the term biome for these two massive structures, that term is more correctly used for something that exists on a whole other scale. Biomes are biological communities that are formed in response to a shared physical climate. They comprise a vast multitude of interwoven habitats. Clearly, on one level, the contents of the carefully controlled bubbles of climatic conditions of the Eden Project are the real thing. Within the four acres of the so-called tropical biome, hundreds of species of trees, plants and animals, all normally found somewhere between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn, 
are living side by side. The genetic credentials of each organism are faultless. On one level, it is indisputably real. However, there is, of course, nothing like the complexity of interactions or the soils built up over centuries and millennia that exists in a genuine tropical rainforest. There's some wonderful wildlife, but a tiny selection. Most visitors would not appreciate the full range of creepy crawlies. The health and safety executive would not look favorably on the presence of some of the more deadly reptiles, larger predators. The fact is that it's real, but not authentic. It's a little bit wild, but not really wild. It's meticulously planned and rigorously regulated. It's a piece of tinned rainforest, hermetically sealed from its temperate surroundings. And what about our churches? Are they authentic, the real deal? Are they communities that emerge out of the work of God's spirit in the lived faith of his people? Are they, as the previous Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, has suggested, what happens when people encounter the risen Jesus and commit themselves to sustaining and deepening that encounter in their encounter with each other? In asking such questions, I, I'm not querying the reality of people's faith. I do not doubt the good intentions of church leaders. I am certainly not questioning the undeniable fact that God is at work in and through church congregations and the lives of so-called churchless Christians. I am, however, suggesting that in our well-meaning efforts to create, facilitate, organize, manage, and control, we are sometimes in danger of surrendering authenticity for mere reality. By having an image of what a good church might be and working towards that end, we easily sacrifice an expression of church which arises from a, a genuine encounter of the gospel with the people whom God is drawing together. By creating and maintaining congregational models that require certain functions and roles, we we forego a community which emerges from the gifts of its people, shaped by the context of their lives and the realities of the wider community. The distinction I'm making may seem obtuse or subtle, but it's certainly important. It's the difference between a community with Jesus at its heart and a club for followers of Jesus. In one, we're firmly in control. The other is the result of our surrendering the driving seat. One is par the parallel of traditional conservation. The other is rewilding. So um, I'm not sure if this question has already been asked. It's possible, but uh, I'm just wondering for how many of you is this your first time at Lee Abbey? Okay, I can't see everybody, um, but I can see a good few of you, and it looked like about half of the ones I could see it's your first time. And how about, um, is it your first time at a Southwest Baptist Association retreat? Okay, slight, slightly less, but still a good good number of people. Yeah, yeah. So, <coughs> excuse me, I was um, I was struck earlier this um, this week or at the weekend. I was reading in John's Gospel, chapter one, and verse thirty five starts off with these words: uh, "John was in that place again." And uh, it's talking about John the Baptist. And so, yeah, you need to look back, of course, at the verses before. And you realize that um, he'd been in the same place the previous day and he'd encountered Jesus. 
And so the next day he went back to the same place and he took some friends with him. He took, because we know that a couple of his disciples then, then uh, followed Jesus. Um, and it's my, it was my first time at Lee Abbey as well. My wife and I, it's our first time, but uh, we first heard about Lee Abbey. I think it was just over 30 years ago. And I remember a friend at that time who'd been on the community here, speaking of it as a, as an incredible place. Um, a place, a place where she had encountered Jesus, kind of a, a thin place, if you like, a place, a fruitful place. Um, so, yeah, I, I've really been praying that it would be that for, for us these days, that this will be a place and a time and a, an, an event, a situation um, where we encounter Jesus. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so these days together, we're, we're going to respond to Jesus's instruction in, in what we call the Sermon on the Mount to to look at the birds of the air and, and to see how the flowers in the fields grow. And in fact, you know, if you look at the words carefully, Jesus didn't just tell people to to take a look at the birds or or cast a kind of passing glance at the flowers. The, the words he chose literally mean um, fix your eyes on these things. Take take a really good look. And we're going to give careful attention to to what creation in in all of its diversity and interconnectedness and beauty and wonder and, and what it might show us in relation to our following Jesus and our life as Christians together. And, you know, for most of Christian history, the idea of, of looking to creation for inspiration and, and, and wisdom and expecting to see God's fingerprints uh, there, finding his presence there, would have been stating the, the absolutely obvious. Um, but at some point, the Christian faith became a, a kind of indoor religion. And, and sometimes there's even been a, a suspicion, a kind of wariness of taking too much interest in the natural world, that somehow the creation can be a, a distraction from the creator. And yet, you know, when we look back through our history, there are rich, thick seams of theology and wisdom that urge us to, to look to nature and, and expect to find their precious insights that will nurture our faith and, and help us understand God's ways and purposes. From, you know, Desert Fathers, Thomas Aquinas, Martin Luther, John Wesley, you know, so many of the, the big hitters and the deep thinkers from, from many different traditions within the church throughout the ages wrote extensively and passionately about this. And the Bible itself, of course, you know, again and again, encourages us to go back to the natural world and to see there the fingerprints of, of the Creator. Uh, within the Psalms, you know, there's just some wonderful outpourings that celebrate the wonder of what we what we now call biodiversity, that astonishing variety and interdependence of, of animals and plants and fungi and how they work together in ecosystems, in intricate webs of life. Um, sometime over these days, you might like to just turn to Psalm 104, um, that's an amazing passage. A central part of that, in particular, is is a wonderful celebration of of all of that. Uh, <coughs> John Muir, the uh, the Scottish uh, export to the U.S., uh, often credited with with founding the National Park movement there, and an early environmentalist, he said, "When we try to pick out." Anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And 
when we look at nature, we keep discovering new ways in how that's true. Um, I got a book for Christmas about fungi, uh, particularly recent discoveries about fungi. And, uh, you know, when you say fungi to, to many people, what we picture is uh, mushrooms, toadstools. Uh, but that is the, the tip of the iceberg. They're just the, the fruiting bodies of, uh, of a fungus and underneath the ground or inside the trees or, or wherever there was an extensive network. When we stand in woodland, think of this when, when you're out for a walk here um, these next couple of days. When we're in woodland, beneath our feet are networks of fine thread-like filaments of fungi known as hyphae that are immeasurable. <clears throat> the extent and complexity of these systems is, is incalculable, um, as is their value to the plants which they connect. Most trees, for example, cohabit with dozens of different species of fungi, and in many cases they, they wouldn't survive without them. Through these, these vast fungal grids, signals are transmitted, um, warning of, of disease or insect attack, drought or other dangers. Um, trees and plants facing difficulties receive help from each other through these fungal networks. It's like an intricate social security system extending over huge distances and stretching through remarkable episodes of time. In a, a really mature forest, one teaspoon of soil can contain many miles of these hyphae, these single cell filaments. And over centuries, a, a single fungus can, can cover many square miles and, and network a, a whole forest. It's yeah, absolutely astounding. The biggest organisms in the world are, are not uh, blue whales or redwood trees, they're, they're fungi, um, one of which has been found that covers nearly 2,500 acres, and they estimate that it's over 2,000 years old. Now, I'm guessing there are bigger ones and older ones somewhere, but that's just the one that uh, we happen to have discovered so far. And as this previously unknown phenomenon came to light in in our era of information technology, these fungal networks have, have been called the wood wide web. And the hyphae filaments themselves have been likened to, to fiber optic cables. But imagine if these discoveries had, had not been made recently, but had been made in the era of the early church. Imagine if the first century scientists were scouting around for metaphors to illustrate their findings. I think the word used for the community that emerged from the events around Pentecost, koinonia, would have served them really well. You know, Luke's eyewitness account of koinonia in the Acts of the Apostles describes a, a network of radical participation, intimate communion, and, and deep sharing. If instead of alluding to the World Wide Web, our imaginary first century scientist chose koinonia to explain the, the astounding interconnectedness and mutuality that they'd unearthed, they might also use agape instead of fiber optic cables as a simile for what actually holds the network together. So I, I hope we're going to enjoy looking afresh at creation these days, not, not just in these talks, um, but as we spend time in this, this beautiful place. Um, let's be open for, uh, for the rich and playful metaphors it offers us, but let's also just, just enjoy it. At the 
part of rewilding is the re the realization that nature has innate capacities for renewal and growth and regeneration and when it's not constrained or chopped up or poisoned it, it bounces back and, and thrives and we've all heard especially the, the confidence there is now of how nature boosts our our well-being and particularly our mental health but our overall well-being may that be your experience these days. May your own experience of being in nature here and our shared experience of reflecting on nature together, may it renew your soul. Just in, in Psalm 23, of course, that connected with the promise of refreshing for the soul is the fact that he makes us green places and beside water. The Lord is my shepherd, I will lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. And that is certainly my prayer for you these days. What I'd like us to do now, please, is um, just pause for a moment and ask yourself the question, how have I come to this retreat? I don't mean by car or train, but how are you as you arrive in this place? Just think about that for a moment. And I wonder if you could just turn turn to a neighbor and just share something of your thoughts about that. Just in a, in a pair for a minute or two. Thank you. 
So if, if you can draw your draw your conversation to a, a close there. <clears throat> now Unfortunately, I, I can't really hear you very well, so um, it's hard to tell. You know, sometimes when you're facilitating these things, you, you know when people have started to talk about other stuff. <laughs> and it's time to, time to move on. But um, I wonder if I could ask you a slightly different question now. Um, again, if you just think about it yourself for a moment, first of all. It's about what you hope for from these days. So, you know, imagine if on Wednesday evening, you uh, get back from here and somebody says to you, oh, how was that thing you went on at Lee Abbey? And you find yourself saying, it was absolutely fantastic. It was just, it was exactly what I needed. What, what would need to happen between now and Wednesday evening for that to be the case. So just, just think about that for a moment. What would be your, your highest hope, your deepest hope? And again, I wonder if you'd share that with uh, with someone and then just, just pause and briefly um, pray for one another. Thank you. 
So if you can draw your prayers to a close there, please. So as well as enjoying nature for its own sake, we're, we're going to reflect on this particular idea within ecology, the idea of, of rewilding or, or wilding, and consider that as a metaphor for what God seems to be doing in the church, reversing its domestication, fostering diversity and because we are the church, how we ourselves are invited to be rewilded as, as we hear the compelling call to, to rediscover the adventure of faith and, and refocus on that, that radical call of Jesus, follow me. Metaphors matter, um, especially when they relate to who you think you are. And when you think about it, pretty much everything we know about what God wants us to be and do as his people together, so how to be church, comes to us in the form of, of metaphors. Um, nearly a hundred metaphors in the New Testament for us, uh, followers of Jesus, both individually and together. Uh, we put a bookmark on your seat, which includes a, a very small sample of them. And the thing about metaphors is that they trigger the imagination. They work through 
the imagination. And unlike uh, nature, within some Christian traditions, there's there's been a bit of a suspicion about the imagination. Um, its use has has sometimes been, well, at least at least neglected and sometimes discouraged. Uh, which is strange when you think about it, because there are some strands of our scriptures which really require our imagination to to be fruitful. So through our retreat, we're going to be looking at and engaging with nature, metaphors, and our imagination. When we do that, we see things we wouldn't have otherwise noticed. So metaphors matter, and, and how we approach them matters too. When I was uh, about nine or ten years old, I was very fortunate in that near where I lived, I was growing up in Lincolnshire, there was a, a bird-watching club. And we used to go away for the day on various trips. And I learned through that experience um, a particular approach to nature. Um, we were encouraged to, to approach with openness, a curiosity, and expectation, and to behave in certain ways. So, for example, you know, if you're coming to a, a gateway in a hedgerow, you would never think of just kind of opening the gate, walking through it into the middle of the next field. You, know, you would approach it um, slowly, and you would maybe just take a peek around the corner of the hedge and, and take time and observe and wonder what kind of habitat is this we're moving into? What kind of things might we see here? And so as we start the re this retreat, I want to offer you a couple of suggestions of ways to approach these days to, to your time outside and, and your time engaging with, with these talks and, and with each other conversations as well. Last week, the Bible readings I was following took me to the account in Luke of what we call the Annunciation. You know, the time when um, an angel, uh, Gabriel, appeared to Mary and broke the news that she was going to give birth to a son. And as I read it, I noticed some things and thought, oh, I should share that as we get started at Lee Abbey. And then as I was thinking about it, I, I googled Annunciation because um, I guess the particular tradition that I've grown up in church has not been big on the kind of Christian calendar and things. So I thought, oh, so Annunciation, what's that? How does that, who celebrates that when? And I discovered that the Feast of Annunciation is celebrated by many Christians across the globe about now. Uh, in fact, I think millions of people were celebrating it this Saturday, just gone, the day before yesterday. And I guess when we think, <coughs> when we think about the account of Mary's encounter with the angel, I think we tend to remember her big yes, her, her willingness, her openness, and, and the hymn that follows, the, the Magnificat, you know, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. But the thing that struck me when I came across it again recently is, yeah, Mary's open hands, her willingness, her surrender, her I'm the Lord's servant, ready to serve, let it be with me, just as you say, didn't come immediately came through a bit of a process. So to begin with, she was terrified. So, you know, rather than having open hands, like a posture of, of yes, I think she probably had clenched fists from, from anxiety, from fear. And then uh, Gabriel responded so graciously to that with those words that we hear over and over in, in the scriptures, do not fear. But after that, Mary was understandably confused. You know, how can this be, she says. 
And if her hands were clenched into fists before, now they may be on her head, you know, in confusion, kind of struggling to understand. And again, Gabriel responds gently, explaining, and, and only then does Mary respond with, with the open heart that we associate with, with that incident. So I, I imagine her going from clenched fists of anxiety to hands on head in, in confusion to then stretching out her hands in a way that indicated her openness to, to all that God had planned. I, I wonder where you are at this afternoon. You've been asking yourself that question. If If you are anxious in any way, then hear those words. Do not be afraid. You know, e easier said than done, you might think, but in a sense, in, in repeating those words again and again throughout Scripture, God is, is simply saying, trust me. So it's, it's not a rebuke, don't be afraid. It, it's a gracious invitation, an outstretched hand. Don't be afraid, but instead trust in the slow work of God. Don't be afraid. Trust in the, the generosity of God. Don't be afraid. Trust in the, in the goodness, the love of God. Or is there any confusion, um, any reason to have not clenched fists perhaps, but hands on your head? How can this be? Um, Again, hear those words that Gabriel said to Mary, for nothing will be impossible with God. So, you know, here we are, 27th of March, 2023. It's the, the one and only. Let's, let's aim to begin this retreat, every aspect of it, uh, with open hands open hands here I am the servant of the Lord let it be with me according to his will the other thing I realized as I reflected on the the Annunciation um, a few days ago was that and this may speak to some of us um, is that God implanted within Mary an embryo uh, an embryo that would grow was not fully formed, but would it would take time to mature. She had to carry that burden, that uh, promise, that life of God, that expectation. She'd she'd heard God's promises about what or who was was growing within her, but she only had the slightest glimpse really of how things would unfold i wonder if that speaks to anyone here perhaps god has planted something in you something that's not fully formed but you're you're carrying it it relates to a promise you know you need to to, to carry this got a glimpse of something to come perhaps you are expectant with an idea, a vision, an inkling of, of something. I wonder if these days might be a time of, of reaffirming your, your yes, your may it be, as you have said, Lord. So in the context of our, our faith and our shared life, together um, metaphors matter it's largely how god has decided to communicate who we are as followers of jesus and, and who we are together as his people and before we we break for dinner i'd like you to just think about metaphors that you find um, especially helpful at the present time are there metaphors that speak to you resonate for you, uh, either for you individually, so who you are in Christ, or 
for the church, who we are together. Um, whether that means the, the one church or, or a particular local expression of church. Just take a moment to think about that. Don't be restricted to those um, hundred or so metaphors in the New Testament. If there are other things that come to mind. Um, yeah, just spend a moment thinking when you think about yourself as a person in Christ or church your local expression of it or beyond, what metaphors come to mind for you? And now, partly inspired by that wood wide web we, uh, I was talking about, I'm wondering if we can bring together some of our thinking on this using the, the wonders of technology. And we're going to try and use this thing called Slido. And uh, if you have a smartphone, if you can take it out, and just put into a, a web browser slido that's s l i d o and i'm going to share my screen here so you can see the number that you need to put into that ah okay i can't share my screen are you able to enable me to share a screen Tom, thank you. Wonderful. That's it. Okay. So, uh, yeah, the number then that you need to put into your Slido is 1162445. You'll see that on the screen in a moment, I think. There we go, yeah. So I think you can see that there, the number. 1162445. Oh, you're, you're on it already. So yeah, if you just type one or two words in there and let's see what we're thinking as a, as a whole group. Um, if you do not have a smartphone with you or are unable to access a smartphone for whatever reason, um, maybe you can get somebody to put yours in too. So please uh, yeah, just be aware of your neighbours if there's somebody who needs, needs some help.
Okay, thank, thanks for that. Can you can people see the smallest writing on there as well as the largest writing? Yes, people seem to be nodding in the front row. I think yes, and and the back row now as well. <laughs> Great. Okay, and they're still coming in. I think. Okay, so I mean, fascinating. So a mix there of, yeah, some of the New Testament metaphors are are there, um, royal priesthood, living stones. Um, mustard seed temple sheep shepherd lots but um lots of others too um some perhaps inspired by the environment here i don't know um but lots of organic ones too fitting with the the metaphor we're going to be thinking about um over these couple of days and some really interesting ones there yeah still still coming in i think Paint palette, willing, weak journeys. Love it. Pool of refreshing, protest march. Yeah, thank you so much. I'll leave that up and feel free to keep <coughs> to add more if you want to. <coughs> I've just seen peat bog come up. Um, it, you might be interested over dinner to ask your neighbours um, what they they shared on this. Uh, Sorry, I've realized that I need to stop sharing my screen. Otherwise, you're going to see all sorts of stuff, including my notes. So I don't want to see that. But uh, but I will save that and we can we can look at that. So if you're adding stuff now, that's fine. You're not just sending it into a black hole. It will be collected and uh, we can have a look at that at that tomorrow. Um, when I wrote the book, uh, The Rewilding the Church, I was sending drafts to, to various friends for some comment. And at the end of each chapter, I, I had text boxes, which had some uh, questions, exercises, little prayers in them. And one of my friends wrote back and commented, he said, oh, aren't you doing exactly what this book is encouraging people not to do you're 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 controlling people you're you're sharing these stories and and ideas and metaphors and then telling them how they should respond to it so i got rid of those boxes and instead inspired by that word that we come across particularly in the psalms and habakkuk that word seller um which you know, sometimes is translated in various ways, sometimes is not translated. It's just either um, omitted or, or transliterated seller. And we don't know exactly what it means, um, but it means something along the lines of you know, a change in, in rhythm or melody, a direction to, to musician or singers or readers perhaps, but whatever the exact meaning it seems likely that the author of those passages wanted the readers and listeners to pause and pay particular attention so maybe it meant something like you know stop and listen or pause and, and think about that it might be a, a contemporary equivalent so having got rid of those text boxes and inspired by that word seller i just put in little pictures of, of post-it notes in the text throughout and encourage the reader to, to stop and and pause and reflect and, and pray and ask what 
a particular story, metaphor, idea might be saying in their context. And at the beginning of the book, I put in a prayer, which I'd like us to, to close this session with. And it's a prayer that reflects that, that open hand attitude of Mary, um, offering the Lord our, our minds and, and hearts as we reflect on these things in nature and um, our reflections upon them. So may I lead you in this, this prayer now, and with that we'll, we'll close. And I think you have dinner in a few moments, and uh, I look forward to, to reconnecting with you in the morning. Let's pray together. Almighty, loving creator, maker of beautiful biodiversity, founder and head of your church, help us to engage with thoughts of nature and church, with minds and hearts open to anything and everything you want to show and teach and do. We pray in the name of the wild Messiah, Jesus, and in the life-giving, fear-quenching power of your spirit, rewild our souls and your church. Amen.